and then to be to to be found by other people well it's you know that's about as good as life gets so I was so happy to be found by you two that was a, a joy and this is this is also a, a joy to um be invited to the very special point in your project and to be able to perhaps give something back in this reciprocity of gifts. So I have, I've, I've written something and I'm going to read it. And if I'm, so that's less engaging because I'm reading, but if I'm going too fast and you're not getting it, just, just like that at the back, you can see me <laughs> just, and I'll just slow down because you know, I, I did think about every word, so I, I would really like it if you if you were able to to follow. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm going to begin. Um, so sociology leans heavily on metaphor in the building of concepts. We might think of the extended metaphors of capitals or the game in the work of Bourdieu, or performance in the stage in the work of Goffman. The enrichment of meaning that can be gained by transposing one object onto another is an essential feature of language and culture. In their classic work, The Metaphors We Live By, Lakoff and Johnson reveal metaphor as a systematic practice linking human bodies to the naming of objects, relationships, and abstract ideas. Most metaphors are invisible to us, simply taking Taking, taken for granted in everyday discourse. New metaphors are exciting and contentious, characterized by a sensuous force. When we are caught in conceptual traps, the best exit is often a change in metaphor. Yet metaphors can also operate conservatively, connecting in ways that reduce rather than enrich our social imaginaries. And having just come from the land of the crown, I can, um, I can um, uh, tell you that there's a, a very, there can be a very oppressive um, uh, uh, effect of metaphor. In a 2020 paper um, that I wrote with my lovely colleague, Jeanetta Ostergaard, we reflected on how we might move beyond well-worn developmental metaphors on youth transition that look increasingly unconvincing in a world of foreclosed futures for young people. Inspired by ideas from queer theory, including the metaphor of the impasse, that's I-M-P-A-S-S-E, French word, which the late Laurent Ballon proposed as a way of staying close to lived experience without presuming a destination. As well as Catherine Bond Stockton's refreshing image of growing sideways rather than growing up. This paper worked with empirical material from an ongoing qualitative longitudinal study of young people's lives in Denmark and from research encounters that resulted from an invitation we made to participants to bring an object to an interview that represented the interlude since we had last seen them. In working with these objects and the talk that they allowed, we came to understand that we were also using metaphor as a method a method for collaborative knowledge building. And this included exploring, for example, Henrietta's jewelry box and Esben's broken watch, both of which provided the starting point for complicated and contradictory stories characterized by entangled temporalities and ambivalent feelings. What we characterized in the paper as a thicker temporality in which the past saturates the present and from which a more ambivalent and sensuous relationship towards an emergent future can be discerned. And I just would uh, point people to really interesting work at the moment that Sina Raven is doing about using objects to um, talk with young people about, about futures, um, looking both at the materiality of the method and the importance of materiality as a method. One of the thrills of working with metaphor is the way that it operates at different scales. Metaphor connects the material embodied world, yeah, like this, to abstract concepts, including big ideas and social theories. 
philosopher, the philosopher um, Harmon writes of a good metaphor's ability to dig underground into the cryptic life of things. And the term cryptic itself encourages us to understand that both revelation and obscuration are at play in the metaphor. As I've always also hinted, metaphors destabilize the boundaries between data and analysis that have traditionally underpinned empirical research. Metaphors are in our theory, but also in our talk, our everyday language and popular culture. The search for metaphor can be a search for interpretation as well as an object of study. While thinking about metaphor, I've enjoyed going back to a 1996 paper by the late Tula Gordon. There's a lot of recently died people, I'm afraid, in, in my paper, which is this also uh, tells you something about yeah, uh, memorialising um, our colleagues. And a very much alive Elena Lahelma, based on their comparative ethnographic, ethnographic research on Finnish and British secondary schools which directly invited young people to produce metaphors, asking them to complete the phrase, school is like, or we might say university is like, and then using these metaphors as a way of organising their analysis. Some of the metaphors generated were familiar, even predictable. School is like a prison. Some were generative, a generative, in that, in that we can begin to see how it might be possible to think about one thing through another, for example, the idea that school is like or school is an ant's nest. But some are ob oblique. The school is a cloud. Working with Lefebvre's notion that metaphors translate, invent and betray, Gordon and Lahelma are interested in thinking how and why certain metaphors come to hand, but also how we work with multiple methods, multiple metaphors as a way of building up insight at different le levels or different scales. So like others working in this space, they reach the work of Paul Ricoeur, whose writings capture this vertiginous aspect of metaphorical discourse, explaining that metaphors operate as a redescription of reality that allow both is and is not to, to be there at the same time. So all of this is a rather circuitous introduction to my presentation and to how I have responded to the invitation that Magda and Anna have made to me to speak at the final conference for their important project that names and investigates biographical echoes. From the outset of this study, I've watched on with interest, fascinating and provoked by the metaphor of the echo that they've mobilized to name and give the study focus. I'm really excited by the opportunity to be an interlocutor, to think with them and with the metaphor of the echo, and to reflect the place of metaphor on the place of metaphors in biographical research. What I promised to do in my abstract was to talk about some of the metaphors that I have worked with over the course of my adventures in the field, and to draw into this space some of the writers and thinkers that I have found to be inspirational and supportive in helping me work through the mass of biographical materials that I've generated with colleagues in various studies that involve longitudinal, intergenerational, ethnographic and archival approaches. Okay. So in 1991, Anthony Giddings came up with the concept of the reflect, or at least published, the concept of the reflexive project of self the not especially original idea that the self is produced and that narratives are a key mechanism through which production is achieved. The concept took off bridging the insights of literary and artistic modernism, but also resonating with the methods of positive psychology and therapeutic culture. The reflexive project of self-centered individual agency without any of the baggage associated with essentialist notions of self. As all good metaphors are, it was timely and refreshing, providing a way of pushing a back against the disappearance of the self associated with post-structuralist emphases on discourse. It also resonated with the emergence of popular practices of documentation that revealed the contingency of self-making in changing circumstances. In cultural studies, this was also a moment 
in, when the family photograph album um, became a, a focus of interest and the revisiting of childhood became a focus of inquiry. Just at the moment that the new sociology of childhood questioned the developmental future-oriented child, the culture embraced develop developmentalism for all. As a metaphor, the reflexive project itself brought together the image of a mirror and the sense of, a, of dynamic relations between inner and outer words with the notion of the project, a forward moving, freed from angst of the uh, forward, move, uh, forward movement that was freed from the angst of, ex, of existentialism by the pragmatism of work as expressed in self-help literature. We might reflect the, that the concept has a debt to Goffman's theatrical extended metaphor, but also notice, need to notice how the, res, the sense of a supporting stage fades away. There was something postmodern about Giddens' his reflexive project of self. The actor steps off the stage into the world and makes it up as she goes along. So this concept, which was part of arguments about a late modernity in which culture overtakes economy and technology as a determining force of social reality, allows us to story the individual as, as the centre of a political remaking in which relationships between copy and original, reality and representation, representation are elided. In 1996, I was launching what was to become a 15-year qualitative longitudinal project, and the concept of the reflexive project of self provided a perfect scaffold, another obviously metaphor, for research that employed repeat biographical in interviews. If the reflexive project of self is made up of stories interrupted and reworked in the face of fateful moments, then a study such as Inventing Adulthoods could document this process. In keeping with late modern notions of escaping and making tradition, remaking tradition, we argued that through this kind of natural history project, we could capture and understand emergent forms of social life and identity. The reflexive project itself was also useful because it was really easy to critique. A focus on the self and self-invention gave no account of power, inequality or conflict. Critics asked difficult questions about who got to tell the stories of self, and how, the, how talking therapies might be associated with particular class, cultures, and capitals. Rather than operating as a vehicle for the creation of new social forms, it was argued by people like Bev Skeggs and Steph Lawler that the reflexive project of self might also be a cover for remaking inequalities in new forms. So the concept of the metaphor was a useful hook for the Inventing Adulthood study in practice. But in practice, we had to augment it, drawing, for example, on late Foucault's, uh, the work of, of late work of Foucault to imagine biographical fields of existence that located individuals within contexts and institutions, as well as interactive dynamics involving competence, recognition, and investment that were necessary in order to link individual projects with processes of social exclusion and inclusion. And since that time, I've been grappling with how to think about the self in time and how documentation plays a part in producing knowledge about the self for researchers, but also for us as social actors. And this has included working with conceptual metaphors that in different ways have enriched my understanding of biographical material. So I'm gonna do a little bit of sharing of some of my highlights. <laughs> The first of these I want to talk about is the kaleidoscope, it's, um, which I discovered through the writings of Liz Stanley. Importantly, this is a metaphor for the practice of biographical research rather than, or in addition to, being a metaphor for the self as it is for Giddens. For Liz Stanley, the kaleidoscope is counterposed with the microscope as an instrument for engaging with the world and producing knowledge. Where the microscope allowed you to get closer, the kaleidoscope provides a fragmented vision that is dynamic. Each time you look, you see something different. And it's an approach that's consistent with Stanley's champion, championing of post-structuralist and feminist epistemologies 
within an autobiographical approach in which the subject and the object of knowledge are linked. Importantly, Stanley's vis vision is informed by working with archival sources and the epistemology of the uh, humanities as well as the social sciences. The interview is not a window into the soul. It is a method for creating a certain kind of document of self, which needs to be treated with curiosity and with caution. We're encouraged to understand the partiality of archives and the social life of documents, which are always the view from somewhere. And this somewhere needs to be part of the story. In Stanley's major work on Olive Schreiner, she builds what she calls an epistolorium, uh, con a, con a connection between the letter writing and communications that happened through and, and with Olive Schreiner. She explores the letter as a form of flight, something dialogical and perspectival, which traces, uh, where traces of a person are expressed in successive points in time to a variety of people and refracted back and forth. So I think maybe a, a, an image that's really valuable to your study. Writing about metaphor in biography, Stanley cautions us that we should think through metaphors, not think by them. Recognizing that where metaphors act, or rather claims to act, as a key to the inner meaning of life, which the reader can then read back into and use to interpret other aspects of life, it acts thereby as a means of closure, for what it provides is a conclusion. So once you've got your metaphor, boom, you're, that's it, you're sorted. And she says, be suspicious. Instead, Stanley reaches to the idea of mimesis as championed by Michael Tausig that turns metaphor into something more practical, active and contested, enabling us to notice the nature that culture uses to create second nature, the faculty to copy, imitate, make models explore difference, yield into and become other, to the point where the representation may even assume the character and power of the original. Famously, Tausig used this approach to understand how ideas of the savage were imposed, embodied and returned to colonizers in modes that could only be understood as complex co-productions Stanley asks us to use the same methods of inquiry to think about researching the past and working with documents of the self. Knowing past lives is always characterized by knowing other lives. The notion that mimesis is implicated in processes of research documentation, as well as everyday practices of memory, knowing and governance, have been inspirational to me helping not only me, not only to understand these documents as rich, rich, relational and complex, but also enabling me to develop an active approach to biographical research that fractures and layers the biographical self and allows for engagement and collaborative inquiry. And one of the ways I've thought about this is through the idea of ventriloquism. So, you know, the ventriloquist um, puppet. The first time I experienced the possibilities of ventriloquism was in uh, our study of um, longitudinal study of motherhood, where the children from the study started growing up as children will. And I invited in an interview, seven-year-old Lucien to read an extract of, of what the field note I had written um, after talking with his family soon after his birth. I can tell you it was a very strange experience, really interesting experience. The performance of the material by Lucien in the interview constituted a research event involving exponential meaning making for all those who were involved. And from that point, we started using ventriloquism in, in various research projects, including a postdoc project with um, a wonderful researcher, Esther McGinney, 
where young people revoiced and responded to the sexual stories of other young people, stepping in and out of the character, both being the, per the person who produced that interview and then not being them and thinking about the differences. Producing different kinds of performance of the same material, sometimes delivered as tragedy, sometimes the same material delivered as comedy. This work developed into a music project where young people express themselves through covering the songs of, uh, written by others. And most recently, we've used ventriloquism has been at the center of uh, our methods for reanimating data in a project that works with contemporary audiences to revisit and engage with archives of a 30-year-old study of young women's sexual life stories. Ironically, this work has helped us understand how talk about and through others can be a way of talking about the self in intimate and surprising ways, offering a kind of cover that allows us to show ourselves in a way that does not make us vulnerable or being known in too direct a way. A key intellectual resource for us in this work has been the idea of temporal drag that's drawn from the work of um, Beth Freeman and her, her book Time Binds, which itself draws on the work of um, Walter Benjamin and his ideas of messianic time. Freeman conceptualizes the time bind as achronic correspondences, connections between the past and present that facilitate anti-narrative leaps across time. Time binds involve mimetic connections that have effective or emotional resonance. And when staged within meaningful intergenerational relations, they can conjure up a sense of afterwardness or a belated understanding, the potential to live a past that she or he could not live at the time. Although focused on the past, such methods ask us to imagine the future in terms of experiences that discourse has not yet caught up with rather than as a legacy that's passed on between generations. So in a sense, they get, it, it, it gets in underneath the well-worn stories. The perfect match in, imagined by the social sciences is not the focus of this approach. Instead, the impossibility of matching like with like is understood, and I'm sure we can talk more about this, <laughs> is understood um, as generative through the embrace of, of the idea of, of an anachronism or habitus out of joint that unsituates viewers from the present tense that they think they know. Freeman seeks a method of literally feeling the historical, focusing on allegory as a literary form that allows the telling of an old story through a new one, suturing two times together but leaving both times visible. In my current project, this involves revisiting and reanimating um, archival um, material um, uh, and the connections with young people in the present can give rise to excitement and a desire to tell the new stories within the original story. We've, in terms of this project, we've imagined the time bind through the metaphor of the wormhole um, that take something that connects two points in space and time and, and allows time travel between. Wormholes can take different forms. Autobiography is one of the easiest ways to do it. And as one of the members of the original research team involved in the revisiting, I found myself repeatedly falling down wormholes. However, our work in the project was also focused on methods of opening up wormholes so that others could join in where the action is. So a wormhole might be shared experiences over time, a shared place, a shared identity. We made, but we may design research around, we may guess what the connections are, but unless they're embraced, and embraced by and meaningful to those making the journey, it is also a method that can fall flat. And I can point you to, we, 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 we have lots about this, which I can point you to at the end of the talk. I want to say something about another metaphor, which is, I think has been very powerful in organizing and thinking about biographical research, which is the palimpsest or the magic writing pad. 
The palimpsest is best known from the work of Freud, who worked with the image of a manuscript written over a partly erased older manuscript in such a way that the old words could be read beneath the new. And he, when he was doing this, he was thinking about the city of Rome um, and thinking about how it connected, how Rome provided a metaphor for the, for the mind and for the unconscious. Within biographical studies, the image of the palimpsest was taken up by Harriet Buram Nielsen as a synthetic metaphor that would allow her to combine historical and cultural understandings of, ge of generation and shared location with psychological notions of individual developmental processes and entangled um, uh, unconscious processes associated with subjectivity. She draws on Freud's use of the metaphor of the palimpsest as a representation of the human mind to consider the coexistence of permanence and change. So, for example, we may, have, we may use different fonts or calligraphies in the magic writing pen, and they, we could think of those as being associated with different stages of the life. The wax block represents subjectivity and the timelessness of the unconscious. So even though the overlying paper is understood as historicized identity work, the, all of the records, all of the imprints continue to be there. The metaphor is stretched to include processes of knowing. Thus, we're invited to think about how different inscriptions are revealed in different kinds of lights and how new inscriptions can be made using old calligraphies. The metaphor delivers a psychosocial dividend allowing us to think some simultaneously with different and usually competing perspectives on biography. So we can jump between psychoanalysis, developmental psychology, history, and cultural studies. It's a rich and productive metaphor, which has been taken up by others. For example, um, uh, Julie McLeod um, has, has used it. But we also perhaps have to caution, be cautious about a metaphor that is so neat <laughs> that explains everything. And in that, that the, the sense in which Liz Stanley says is, is a conclusion, that's it, explains everything, you can fit everything into the metaphor. The last metaphor in terms of, of things that I have found or am finding inspirational um, is the metaphor of the chorus that's, that I've, I've discovered through the work of Sedia Hartman to capture something that goes beyond the named individual gesturing to wider collective formations and struggles that endure over time and where individuals can disappear whilst other individuals carry on. So it really displaces the individual in, in an important way. Hartman's work is concerned with the unnamed ordinary black girls who rushed to American cities at the turn of the 20th century. Young women who, I'm quoting her, were credited with nothing deemed unfit for history, yet are recognized by Hartman through their traces in the archive as radical thinkers who tirelessly imagined other ways to live. The image of the chorus works for, in many ways for Hartman, not only through the masks, um, so that it, in a sense it captures nameless um, protagonists, um, faceless girls who, in her words, are unfit for history, but also because Many of these young women were also careened, so they were on the chorus line. They, they worked in, in nightclubs and they, their legs went like that together. Um, they were part of chorus lines of dancers in the new clubs that emerged in the ghettos in the cities. Yet the metaphor of the chorus bears even more. The Greek etymology of the word chorus refers to a dance within an enclosure. And this is a quotation. What better articulates the long history of struggle the ceaseless practice of black radicalism and refusal, the tumult and upheaval of open rebellion than an act of collaboration and improvisation that unfolds within a space of enclosure. The chorus is a vehicle for another kind of story, not of the great man or the tragic hero, but one in which all modalities play a part, where the headless group incites change, where mutual aid provides the, the resource for collective action, not leader and mass where the untranslatable songs and seeming nonsense make good the promise of revolution. Um, 
and yeah, there's, I, 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 there's, it's been used also in other ways recently, which I, I won't go into, into now. So in this quick review of some of my favorite metaphors within biographical studies, I've focused on figurative language that helps us to think about selves over and in time, or to perhaps to think beyond self, as, um, and images that help us recognize the complexity of selves as situated, connected, documented, or undocumented, and examined from changing positions in time, space, and the kaleidoscope. I've also pointed to how metaphors work at different scales, including conceptual metaphors, analytic metaphors, and methods that harness mimetic capacities in meaning making. So as we move from thinking about individuals toward think, towards thinking about families and generations, we need metaphors that help us to think about dynamic collective. Transi transition is such an obvious term in family sociology that we can miss that it is also a metaphor taken from medicine and from electronics, sensitizing us to the movement of material between a transmitter and a receiver. In a world beyond electronics, Transmission is neither direct or simple. As one woman I interviewed so vividly put it, you make gravy the same way you mo your mother did, but the recipe changes. We might, like Julia Brannan and her colleagues, conceptualize an ambivalence at the heart of intergenerational relationships, forms of recalibration and transformation that are necessary for connection to be maintained in the context of dynamic social historical landscapes. Although phrases and images may, in the words of oral and family historian Paul Thompson, echo down the generations, they, not do, they do not do so in direct or literal manner. Roots of communication and transmission are blocked, meanings are condensed and renewed. Rupture and trauma may mean that the material is not simply available through language and stories, but may be apprehended in embodied, embodied um, ways that involve repetitions rather than resolution. Gabrielle Rosenthal and colleagues call these the unconscious family dial uh, dialogues, something picked up by Valerie Walkerdine and colleagues who take the phrase when history walked into the door from the clinical work of French analysts Devoin and Godier to capture the character of unresolved historical trauma in stories and embodied presence. Of individual storytellers. So in research we may find ourselves to be engaging in recurs metaphoric discourse that allows things to be true and untrue at the same time um, and also thinking about the different positions that people may take up um, may take up in, in families and how they change over time in different configurations. So finally echo, <laughs> I'm sorry it's taken so long to get here, so what might the metaphor of the echo open up for us as a way of imagining and conducting biographical research? In classical mythology, echo was a nymph. She was talkative, energetic, and unfortunately for her, noticed by Zeus. For this, she was, um, she was punished by Hera, losing her capacity to speak on her own behalf, fated instead to repeat the last phrase of the words of others. Not surprisingly, Echo has been taken up in feminist theories, a figure to think with, emblematic, for example, of Helen Sixu's écriture féminine as a way of imagining the condition of being outside language and yet engaging with it in disruptive ways. The figure of Echo is also taken up by Spivak, who observes that one cannot echo willingly, which I think is a really, really um, uh, important insight characterizing her mimetic fate as negotiating without choice with structures inherited from colonialism. So Echo alerts us to the limits of agency in the structures and cultures and conditions that we inherit. But that's not the end to Echo's travails. Echo falls in love with Narcissus, a beautiful boy who finds her approach to language confounding and irritating. He rejects her advances as he has rejected the advances of many others. Nemesis, the goddess of revenge, punishes Narcissus, leading him to a woodland pool where he sees and falls in love with the reflective vision of himself. Distraught by the lack of response from his reflection, 
unrequited love multiplies exponentially, exponentially. Both Echo and Narcissus waste away, connected yet isolated. It's a tragic situation and profoundly recognizable, perhaps especially in an era of social media. As a myth, it's complex. And her es in her essay, Echo, Spivak reminds us that Echo's punishment is itself the precondition of the story of Narcissus, whose fascination with the self is taken up as an image of a narcissistic society. For Spivak, it is not Narcissus, but the icon of the pair that, that is particularly important. In her words, Narcissus is fixed, whilst Echo can disseminate. Narcissus is immobile, while Echo is from elsewhere. This particular image of Echo and Narcissus was created by a sculptor, Glyn, um, well, actually an, a, a painter who sculpted sometimes, Glyn Philpott, a London-based society portraitist and queer artist from the turn of the century. It's a rendition that captures something of the sexual politics and the unrequited desires of his milieu, representing perhaps what Elaine Shawalter calls the twin figures of the social apocalypse, the new woman and the decadent man. Clearly, he recognizes something in the myth, and perhaps today we recognize something a bit different, yet with, with legacies rooted in these insights. The ways that we may be dependent on others to know ourselves and to be known, and how this may set in play powerful emotional dynamics that are not easily resolved. So how might Echo help us think about biography? Well, first it helps us read between the lines or the edges of language. If we find traces of story and repetition, we are alerted to the possibility that these may stand for something and that it is and and that it may stand for something that is still unknown and unexpressed. This might be a trauma that is not yet in language and which is acted out and repeated. It might be a family secret forgotten or a story that's hard to tell, overlaid with one that is in part fantasy, the kind of uchronic dreams described by Alessandro Portelli. Secondly, the echo may help us understand the entanglement of selves that may be in play in biographical research, especially when we extend from the individual to those around them, the people and institutions that they bounce off. The precise question of who who, who is who and what belongs to who and how is one known or captured in this method? Remember, one cannot echo willingly. Third, the myth draws our attention to misunderstanding or perhaps it's your mismatches and not knowing and how these may be powerfully involved in affections and identifications. Narcissus does not understand that he is pursuing his own image, nor does he properly understand who Echo is and what she is saying. Yes, she returns an imitation or a repetition of the original words, but it's partial, incomplete, and misleading. So fourthly, Echo and Narcissus myth has dramatic tension. Perhaps Echo could and should save Narcissus from his fate, if only they could see and hear each other. The unrequiting love, love may well be more powerful and revealing than the marriage plot that underpins it. The image holds us in its grip as a tragic narrative complication that will only be resolved by the death of the two protagonists, neither of us, neither of whom have the eternal life of the gods um, who so cruelly, so cruelly play with their fates. And as a metaphor, it captures the limits of agency, the mobilizing energy of desires unfulfilled and the intimacy of fate, fates so closely tied, nestling together in convoy. Offer, um, offers that fail to be received. And I think there was a wonderful work of Daniel Berto and Isabel Riame talking about how offers have to be received um, and that, that that's where the, the drama often is, the failure to receive an offer. So I'm going to end this paper um, with a bit of engagement with Andrew Abbott's thinking about lyrical sociology as explored in his 2007 paper Against Narrative a preface to lyrical sociology. As someone who spent his career thinking about time in social theory and social research and analytics, Abbott asks us to consider a binary divide between narrative 
and lyrical perspective that doesn't just map onto qualitative and quantitative. It is a distinction that instead maps onto notions of temps and durée, or what, or what he calls ordered and tensed time. Narrative is concerned with the branching and sequencing of events, possibilities and consequences, and causal analytics that allow us to take up abstract positions, a view from nowhere. Anti-intuitively, he suggests that variable approaches and quantitative research are deeply narrative. He counterposes narrative approaches with the lyrical, which are, which are concerned with congeries of image, indexical relations in time and space, here and nowness, and an emphasis on feeling rather than showing reality. At its best, this approach provides a far more effective sense of, of passing time. The lyrical is not posed by Abbott as an alternative to narrative modes, which might, which might imagine the echo as some form of triangulation, pinning things down, showing reality in an ordered way. But it's an important corrective that is attuned to human experience of living in collective convoys, choruses that exist through time and which may be apprehended through narratives with the quality of a faceted gem, a kaleidoscope, a cover story or an echo. Um, and I'm just going to make a couple of points in conclusion. So by reviewing the importance of metaphor in biographical research, I hope to have enlivened our lyrical sensibilities um, and shown some of the traditions that might be informing this project. Suggested that metaphors are multi-scalar, they can work as methods as well as theorizations, that they review, reveal and obscure providing a focus whilst also condensing and simplifying meaning. They are the product of their time. Old method, metaphors are invisible. New method, metaphors can refresh and invigorate. Metaphors are the building block of myth. I've also hoped to bring Echo and Narcissus to life as a way of engaging with this important project that's pushing on the boundaries of family sociology and life course research insisting on our ability to work between inner and outer worlds, to connect bi biography and history, and to do this in a reflexive way that understands our practices of knowledge making as part of the world that we seek to understand and contribute to. So thank you so much to both of you for the opportunity to think with you today. Thank you.